All right, so I'm going to get started. This is hiring for hopeless perfectionists. Um, and if you do the Twitter thing, I included those on there, so feel free to tweet if you like. Um, so if you came to Flash Forward yesterday, I claimed that the hiring process at TGC is pretty integral to kind of the kind of games we make. And so I wanted to give a talk about how does a small studio create a large impact within the industry. So thanks for joining me for hiring for hopeless perfectionists. So um, who am I? My name is Sunny Pavlovich. I'm the studio manager at that game company. I've been there for three years. I've been in the game industry for five years, and for a few years prior to that, I was in entertainment, and I was doing things such as production, marketing, project management, localization, hiring, all those sorts of things, which tie really neatly into what I do in my current role as studio manager. Basically, I oversee internal operations and external relationships. So when I was hired three years ago, believe it or not, that game company included a total of three people in 2012. Um, so obviously, they had made three games. It wasn't like there was only three people making those games, but that what happened there is a topic for another talk and has been covered in other interviews and such. Not So I'm not going to go into that because that's not the focus for my talk today. I'm really going to be talking about how we went from these three people when I started to building a studio of 15 full-time people and two part-time people. And that is as of March 2015. So in addition to the three leads uh, that were there when I started, there are also four other returning developers from our previous games. So what has that game company done? We've made three games for the PlayStation 3. The first one was Flow in 2007. Then we came out with Flower in 2009. And our most recent title was Journey in 2012. So each of these games are award-winning games that have received numerous industry honors, including Game of the Year for Journey. And they've inspired a wide array of eclectic and devoted fan art, which, you know, makes us really happy. But really the point of all this is that the games themselves were the result of relentless, hopeless perfectionism. And I think that's a trait that defines that game company that I want to talk about more today and how we built that studio and because that's what has allowed such a small development team to create the kind of memorable game experiences that people have come to know and, and associate with our studio. So talking about inspirations, what are, I have a couple of inspirations for this talk. And so the first one is, within the industry, that game company is kind of, might be considered an anomaly. And so people often come to us and ask, you know, what is the philosophy that allows your studio to make these games. Like, how did you guys do it? So this talk, Hiring for Hopeless Perfectionists, is my way of demystifying that game company's internal process and guiding values. I would say my inspiration number two is, hey, I'm talking about hiring. Uh, why would I talk about hiring at the Game Developers Conference? Because, in my view, hiring is such an integral process to the kind of games we make and the studio we're building and for something that touches virtually every aspect of game development, it gets so little of attention. So I'm here to throw a spotlight on this critical process and what has worked when we're hiring for our studio and why. And really my goal for this talk for you guys afterwards is I want to leave you with a newfound appreciation and understanding for the hiring process and all the work that really goes into it, into doing it well. So hopefully it will inspire reflection and leave you with some ideas to take back with you to your own studio and like discuss further about maybe things that you might want to start doing too. So there are many, many ways to hire and grow a studio. And that game company obviously is just one of them. But I think of all the ways, they're not all ide ideal. And for example, you have something that kind of looks like this. So why is this not ideal? It's very efficient, and the hires are generic, expendable, and replaceable. So if you're thinking about it from a financial perspective, this is probably perfect. But if you're thinking about this from a creative perspective, this is not what you want. It's completely impersonal, and it's not very remarkable. And it, as a result, it's not going to lead to very remarkable games. So I would say if you took this approach, predicted outcomes would probably be you're not hiring very carefully to build a, you know, a very specific team that works well together, that has a lot of cohesion, that's going to have a lot of retention. 
the team members, knowing that they were hired kind of generically, they're not going to have so much personal investment in what they're making and ownership and like that dedication to go the extra mile. As a result, if they don't really care about the quality of the product as much as they could, the product itself might be somewhat mediocre. Um, obviously, this is going to create stress within the studio, which is not good for creative people, but also uh, the upper level management might induce a lot of crunching, which is not fun for the employees. And then for all the crunching that may go into a mediocre product, it could potentially lead to layoffs anyway, so not, not ideal. So I think there's a better way to hire. And this is what I've tried to do during my time at TTC, is uh, very carefully and slowly pick individual peoples for all the skills and experience that they bring and how they complement each other. So we have this one whole cohesive team of very interesting and wonderful people. Is that everyone? No? OK, there we go. OK, that's everyone. Oops, let me go back. Oh, geez. <laughs> All right. So um, the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that building a studio is so much more than you're not just filling a place with warm bodies who can do work. And uh, I think if that's not your goal, then the hiring mentality you take has to reflect that. So we have to ask ourselves, what is our goal? And it's so much more than, hey, I'm hiring. Here's an employment offer. So what I'm trying to say is hiring is important. And even more broadly, I would go as far to say is it's a foundational pillar that you should create in your overall strategy as a studio of, you know, really, where do you want to take your studio? What kind of people do you want to be putting in your studio? To what kind of outcomes do you want to have? And this may be obvious, but when I talk about hiring, I'm really talking about hiring well. And hiring well means you put a lot of thought, attention, and care into this process. Just like you do when you're making games, obviously input is output, so hire well. And hiring never ends. It's an ongoing process. Again, it's not just giving out offers, but it's about once these people get into your studio, how do you empower them? How do you get them to be creative? How are they invested in doing their best work? How do you get them to retain and spread the word that, hey, this is a great place to work, you know, and so on, so that they're bringing their uh, like-minded individuals to come join you. So there's a saying, ABC, always be closing. I would say, always be hiring, because hiring is an end. Because the ideal goal is to talk about how do we build something like this, and how do we avoid building something like this. So as a quick intro, those are the underlying principles um, about hiring at TGC. So since this talk is hiring for hopeless perfectionists, let's get back to our hopeless perfectionists. So these are our hopeless perfectionists. They are the executive team at TGC now, and they are our lead developers. They were there since the beginning um, on Flow, Flower, and Journey. So I would say the hopeless perfectionism that pervades our studio really starts with these three. Uh, what is a hopeless perfectionist? Obviously, I have to define that. So I would say there's three qualities. First is you devote an immense amount of time and attention to quality and craft, and that's pretty much goal number one. You are a truth seeker. You rely on experience and experimentation. You don't rely on conventional methods and what other people do. You're in an ongoing struggle to reach ever new heights because you're never really satisfied with your, your last uh, achievement or accomplishment, but always seeking to do something better. That's a hopeless perfectionist. So when we talk about hopeless perfectionism uh, and how our studio is structured and how we set about our goals, it's really based on what are our strengths of the studio and what are our weaknesses and how do we always work um, on capitalizing on our strengths to compensate for the weaknesses. So um, as hopeless perfectionists who spend way too much time thinking and working on game development, the things that we're good at are making games that are artistic, that have lots of high polish, that can be attractive and accessible to a large group of people. That makes up for our weaknesses, which typically fall under categories like business development. We're not thinking so much and we're not devoting specifically the resources to, like, well, how do we recruit people? And kind of our philosophy always falls back to the strengths. And really what we enjoy doing is, like, well, if we make an awesome game, people will find out about it, and they'll be like, hey, I want to do that too. So we don't really need to 
spend as much time on recruitment, which we don't want to do anyway. And things like management and marketing. If, if you're making a great game, people are talking about your game. So this leads me to a key point. Um, if there's one thing I've learned about that game company, it's that they're an obsessively product-focused studio. And that's uh, what we live, breathe, and talk about every single day. Um, so full stop on that one. So talking about, well, since we are an obsessively product-focused studio, what does that mean? Um, there are two roles. The bulk of activity and resources go to development because that's what your product is. Example, uh, when we moved into our new studio back in, uh, I think, 2013, the t previous tenants left a bunch of leftover mugs that they never used. And so what did we do? We happily opened the box and started using them, especially as we hired and had more people on our team. And we're like, hey, mugs, because mugs are mugs. But because um, we don't care about spending our resources on buying mugs, because you'll still be able to drink your coffee and tea. But if you ask, like, hey, I need this new hardware because I want to do this cool thing, and you know this, this isn't cutting it anymore, we're like, sure, no question, we'll buy it. So yeah, resources go to development, because that's what we care about. And secondly, if it doesn't support the product, it doesn't matter. And that comes up on, in so many ways. If uh, someone says, like, hey, here's this new initiative, or like, hey, why don't we do more press? It's like, well, is that going to help the product? No. Then there's like, hey, we have 15 people. There's no one there to do it. We don't want to spend the time or money. So a really great example of this, and something that I get a lot of flack for sometimes, both uh, from like our publicists and other marketing people is, hey, this is our website, guess what? It's circa 2006, the year the company started. Um, because, you know, sure, there are people in our studio who have web development skills, but it's sort of a question of, do you want to be making on the game or do you want to be working on the website? So um, you can, if you look at our jobs page, there's photos from our studio back in 2009 when we were all young and skinny. Um, so we're not great at conventional marketing, and it shows. So when we are hiring, though, what is it that we're looking for, and what is our larger strategy since that's, uh, we want to build to our strengths? So we're very product-focused. So when we hire, since we started out with hiring hopeless, or bringing together these hopeless perfectionists, hopeless perfectionists want to work with other people with similar values and who are aligned in their goals. So they want to work with other hopeless perfectionists, people who are always seeking that, um, the highest that they can do. So you either hire more hopeless perfectionists or you hire people who work well and support hopeless perfectionists because the truth is, and I'm not going to lie, hopeless perfectionists are not perfect. They are far from perfect. They are very imbalanced people. They have, they're very good at certain things, and so they, you need other people to create a cohesive whole. The point is you have a team that's all aligned working towards the same goal. Um, and when you hire creatives, what are things that they really, uh, which gets them to do their best work? You want to look for people who, who are directly invested and motivated to do their best work because they feel a sense of personal ownership. So um, when you think about like layers of bureaucracy or management, it's like we try to re remove that as much as possible. It's like, hey, we hired you because we think you're the best at what you do and we trust you. I think trust is so fundamental. And I'll talk about this later in my talk about how we have this really um, extensive hiring process. And that's because we want to hire these people who once like the hiring, pro like once you've got the offer and you're in the studio, it's like, go wild, we trust you, do the best you can. And so if these are really talented, hardworking people, you want to give them direct feedback, and, which is basically a reward for they did a good job, they made choices. So it's like they can instantly make decisions about, hey, I think this is a good way to do it, let's do it. And then they see like, oh, that didn't lead to the experience. I thought, okay, let me change that. And that's what rewards them. That's how they're motivated. They don't have a manager telling them, hey, I need you to do these five things by the end of the week. Um, so you're self-motivated, self-managed, there's no external bureaucracy, and you're accountable to each other and yourself. So now I'm going to talk about, so how did we actually start building the studio? How did we start recruiting and hiring and bringing these people together before there was even a product? Like where, does, what's the origin story for TGC? So I would, I'll just let you know, like to make a big impact, you need to have 
a small team and you need these people who have, who are very talented and very invested in doing these things. So the studio co-founders really found each other even way back then based on product because they're very product focused. So as students, because this, the company was started straight out of when uh, everyone who started the studio was in school. So they were making games as students. Um, they basically just kept running into each other at student game festivals because back then they just spent all their free time making games and doing the best they can and being recognized for it. So even though that their network at the time was small and like they had nothing like, hey, let's hire a recruiter and let's put out ads, I'm going to start a studio. It's just, you, it's very easy to identify other people with similar drive and dedication and talent and, and this entrepreneurial spirit, which is really what it takes to start a small studio. So, um, because it's like, hey, we keep making these student games and running into each other, so now it's time to found a studio. I guess I want to work with you because I know, I know you and I know you do good work and we can work well together. So what does that look like? Going all the way back to 2005, at GDC, at the IGS Student Showcase, we had these two games show up um, among about 10. Um, so back then, it was just like there was a student showcase, there was no like single winner. So we had this game, Diadin and Mutton Mayhem, which probably none of you have ever heard, even if you're like huge fans of that game company. So what does that look like? This is the Diadin team with our TGC audio director, Vincent Diamante, uh, working on that student project. If you remember, not only did Vincent work on these projects, he also joined that game company to do the music composition for Flower and is, yeah, a current audio director. And then here we have TGC creative director, Genova Chen, uh, for the, now, the second game, Mutton Mayhem, we have TGC lead engineer, John Edwards. So, 2005 IGF Student Showcase. Next year rolls around, oh, there's another uh, student game competition. It's called Slam Dance Gorilla Game Maker Competition. Many of you may not have heard of this because it lasted about two years. But back then, that's where the students were going to show the games. Um, and so in 2006, there were, it was a new set of games. This was Cloud, which you may be familiar with if you're familiar with that game company, and Ocular Inc. And once again, what do we see? We have ladies and engineer John Edwards and Genova Chen showing up at this with their respective games. Okay, later in 2006, we're back at GDC. Oops. We're back at GDC. Okay, we're back at GDC for the student showcase once again. Again, winning our Cloud and Ocular Inc. So you can see this trend here. There's not that many uh, students making these games, but they keep running into each other. Which brings us fast forward to 2007. By now, that game coming has already been formed. We're working on our first game, Flow, for PlayStation, um, which is just a a remake of the student version of Flow for PC. And this is the founding team of TGC way back when. So we have on the left Kelly Santiago, who worked on Cloud. We have Nick Clark, who worked on Flow at USC with Genova Chen. Um, you can see peeking under his jacket is a Flow shirt. Then we have Austin Wintery, who also went to USC and worked on Flow. And um, Many people may be familiar, he joined us again to work on Journey to write the music for that. Next to Austin in the middle is Genova, and once again we have John Edwards. So these are the, this is TGC in its uh, earliest days. And again, Vincent would come back later to work on Flower After Flow. So I wanted to ask if anyone's been paying attention, did you notice that uh, <laughs> TGC's lead engineer, oops, I went too fast. Where are my slides? Oh, I know. Sorry about this. Okay, GDC 2007. Uh, yeah, did you notice that uh, GDC's lead engineer doesn't take any front-facing photos? I think he's just a shy guy. Okay, so bonus tip, since we're at GDC. <laughs> You know what else happens at GDC? If you're driving along Interstate 5 in California, you might get inspired to make your next game 
and first original IP as a studio. So just a thought. Anyway, that was footage from Flower, if you couldn't tell. Um, okay, so now we have a studio, we have a product, we're product focused, we have something to talk about. So how do we build a studio with that in mind? So we're getting the word about hiring. And remember, that game company is an obsessively product focused studio. We really want to just be making games. We don't want to be doing anything else. Um, but you know what? Even though we're straight up terrible at conventional marketing and recruiting, we know that brand building does help the product and so does hiring well. So when we do have to do kind of like external public facing things, it's still about the product. So what do we do? We give talks. This is Genova Chen at the 2014 Games for Change keynote. Um, and when we give talks, it's mostly about our products and our process, because that's what we are, um, that's what we know, that's what we feel is worth sharing. Because honestly, hiring is a numbers game, and you never know what, which one exactly is gonna hit with, or resonate with the person you wanna hire. But the more brand re reputation we build based on external outreach around our product, the higher the chances that we're gonna find some good hires because of it. So this is reputation building. Um, this is how TGC does marketing. Plus, it's good karma to share knowledge with our peers at conferences like GDC, as you see, Genoma Chan and Nick Clark. Because at heart, we just want to make great products. Giving talks is a byproduct and conduit to making great games, so we make time for it, even when we would rather be designing or rather be coding. Okay, so if we're doing our jobs well, which hopefully we are, and creating these memorable game experiences, the press is going to be more motivated and likely to reach out and build stories around our studio, which really cuts out the need for us to go out and, like, um, kind of chill and be like, hey, notice us. It, like, they already think, hey, these are some people doing something special. This is worth talking about. Let's, let's do a story. Um, saving more resources back for development. So what I'm saying is, yeah, external research, uh, external outreach always comes back to the product. So that's how we get the word out. So now how do we actually go about hiring these people? What is our process like? You know, the nitty gritty it looks something like this. First, I want to mention where do our eventual hires come from? So I would say the number three is from our via application on our website. So we do hire on there, but it's in third place. Second place would be speaking and actually doing things like what I'm doing now um, puts me and the rest of the team in touch with people who are like, hey, I dig what you do. I think I'm qualified. Um, let's talk. And then the number one is personal recommendations. So those are that's when someone we trust and know within the industry is like, hey, I, you know, here's a promising student, or hey, I know look, someone who's looking to switch their job, you really should talk to them. And I just want to be clear that even though personal recommendations uh, is the number one way we've had most of our hires, it's not to say like a personal recommendation is like a guarantee, like, hey, we're going to hire you. It just means that these people are familiar with what we're looking for and what we need, and so it tends to have higher yield than, say, job application where just anyone is applying, but we still hire from there. Okay, so this is what our job application form looks like. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, it's a Google form, it's not fancy. It probably started when we built our website and so like that serviced us and it works. Not exciting. Um, how about cover letters? So I think cover letters within our studio is a bit like, I would say it's slightly controversial, maybe that's not the right word, but in the sense that, like, I like cover letters because when I read them, I get a sense of a person's personality. And if you think about what a cover letter is, it's really just, like, how to get noticed and make yourself stand out. But other, you know, it doesn't work, or it works against some people if you require a cover letter, so we don't. And the reason is, if English is not your native language, you're maybe not going to write a great cover letter. And for games that don't really feature language, we don't really care if you have great English. And secondly, if you're a creative person and you aren't the best at writing, but you're great at art, you're great at programming, you, why would you be motivated to spend time to write a cover letter when you could just like create something awesome? Which is why I actually selected this image. So this image is fan art, um, and it comes from someone we eventually hired as an artist intern for one summer. And she never 
originally expressed interest in working for us, and she was never considering game development. But what happened is, even though as someone who actually didn't really play any games, I think Journey might have been the second game she ever played, she fell head and over heels for it, and she loved the art style, and she gravitated towards it. So she kept tweeting at us, like, hey, that game company, like, here's some art I did. And eventually I would call that, that's a non-traditional cover letter because she was doing her part to express an interest and uh, an alignment in the company. And so I reached out to her and was like, hey, maybe you should consider working for us. And she did um, for the summer. Eventually what happened, though, is she's now working at Disney. And I think this is actually a salient point because it's something that the game industry can learn about, at least when it comes to the products we make and how we hire um, when I was trying to hire a concept artist role, I was working really hard to see about trying to diversify the applicant pool. And so I was looking, like I took the initiative to seek out a lot of female artists. Um, and I was checking like dozens and dozens and dozens of portfolios. And what I was finding is a lot of the best talent, um, uh, and these, again, these were not people who were applying. I was just saying, who, who does great concept artwork? A lot of these people were at Disney, and a lot of them tended to be female. And I was thinking, how come you don't see these people in the industry in greater numbers? Why are they all at Disney? And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. One, Disney is a company that's known for being very family-friendly and like employee-focused and having great benefits. Um, and so they encourage like a nice work-life balance. But also, if you think about it, as a kid, everyone watched Disney films, and everyone kind of fell in love with that. So if you, when you get older and you're going through school and you're graduating and you're looking for a job, where do you want to work? You want to work at places that make awesome stuff. And guess what? Games don't traditionally appeal to women in very high numbers. So I think in a very, very tangential way, how that game company hires is by making those products that... Uh, appeals to more people that will hopefully then help diversify the people who are working for us. Um, and so that's one thing we can learn from film and animation. Uh, they know how to create experiences that speak to a lot of people. So just a side note there. Okay, so now we're going to talk about resumes. So resumes do some things really well. I'll just say that like first. You know, at a quick glance, you can match up a candidate's focus, priorities, baseline skills, Past work environments, for example, have they been working in small studio environments or are they coming from mega studios? And you know, that really does matter when you think about who can be the most effective in a small studio. But I think resumes have also a lot of downsides. Um, they don't indicate talent. You can't tell what their values are. You don't know what their taste is. So resumes have very limiting information. So this is an example of a resume I got, and obviously I anonymized it. Um, but I wanted to show you why this resume was particularly terrible and I don't like resumes. There's like so little white space. Maybe this doesn't come across very clearly, but um, for example, they really packed in all the text that they could. There was so little space between the lines. They chose like the tiniest font ever, like point, like eight or nine point. Um, and you know what? It was three pages long. It was three pages of this. And so what does that tell me right off the bat? You don't know what you want. You don't really want to work here. You haven't focused on telling me, like, this is what I can give you. You're just like, here's the things I've been doing for the past 10 years. Um, and unfortunately, the font was so small, I literally couldn't read it. And I was just like, sorry, I, this person was not under consideration anymore. So I don't love resumes, but I love portfolios because um, at a quick glance, I know a candidate's focus, I know their priorities, I know their baseline skills, I know their past work environments. Um, so here's an example of a application that I thought was awesome, and we went on to hire this person, and I'm very happy. Oh, I should note, we went on to hire this person, and because they had such an awesome application and portfolio, this is an example of someone who did apply via a website, they didn't know anyone at the studio. They didn't know anyone that we knew. They just applied. They were like, here's what I can do. And um, I wanted to anonymize it, so I did some Photoshop work just to respect privacy. But like, here's why I love it. Portfolio, bam. I click on it. I can see uh, what they did. Here, very concisely, they're like, here's who I am. Here's what I've done. Here's how to contact me further. And really nice visual layout of, hey, find out more about me. Click these links. And so I'm actually going to show you a, a small snippet of what, um, 
what they what their demo reel look like. And I want to mention that this is someone who came straight out of school, um, and I I appreciated that they were able to. I could see that they had worked on 3D game environments and they'd worked in small teams and they had a very interesting approach to game design and aesthetic and that instantly caught my eye. I was like, there's not that many students coming out of a school these days with this kind of background. So I can see, yeah, like, they're making these very interesting choices and creating this world and atmosphere. And it shows like they know they, they have a wide range and they're, they just have a baseline talent that was exciting. So yes, successful hire currently in our studio. Um, so you've submitted a resume or an application or your portfolio and I'm like, hey, this is cool, let's talk more. So interview screens are pretty standard within the industry. So I like to think that you know, there's several key functions that take place whenever you do an interview screen. Um, number one is inform. So let's say I'm talking on the phone with the candidate, and I was like, okay, well, here's the role we're hiring for. Um, for example, let's say we're hiring a field engineer. So as a field engineer, you, and, you know, also what's the structure of the studio, where are the values of the team? It's like, okay, we're a small team. Everyone knows each other. It's very transparent. You have access to anyone you want. Like if you if you want to go talk to an artist, you want to go talk to a composer, they're sitting right next to you, jam out ideas. Like totally you can do what you want. Um, and because of that, if you have a lot of motivation, you'll, you'll like working here. If you like working in small team sizes that don't have... Um, you know, like I said, a lot of management over uh, watching over you. So our process is, hey, we do a lot of iteration. We, we fail a lot. But I think it's exciting because you get to try out ideas and you put them actually in the game. Like you're constantly working on stuff. It doesn't work. That's okay. You throw it away. Um, but it's up to you. What do you think is best in the game? Do it. So I talk about the role and I talk about... Uh, what, how, how do we work in the studio? How do we walk, uh, work together? How do we communicate together? Um, and then I, I try and sell them. And a lot of times after I've had, like towards the end of the phone call, I'm like, do you have any questions? And they'll say, what do you like about your job? I'm like, well, let me tell you. And I start getting really excited because I was like, I work with these like awesome people. They're so smart. And all my previous jobs, like I would be the one who was... Uh, putting in the extra hours and like pushing and like, hey, we can do this better. And, you know, oh, like, that's not good enough. Let's spend more time. And this is the first time I've been in a company where it's like, oh, I'm pushing hard to keep up with everyone else as opposed to like, oh, I'm trying to pull everyone along with me. So I get really excited about that. And I'm like, I'm working with these people who are super passionate and they have all this integrity um, to create this really pure for the player experience and they're so smart, and I'm sitting in these design meetings, and it's like, it's totally, it's not structured. It's not like we came in with a goal. We're just like, okay, we're going to have a design meeting. Let's sit down. We're not, we, we don't have a design document. It's just like, hey, I'm just going to throw out some ideas, and they start, like, sketching on a whiteboard, and it's like, oh, my gosh, it's so amazing. Oh, my gosh, that totally would work. Oh, I'm so excited for this game, even though it's just, like, sketches on a whiteboard. Like, oh, I can see it. And so I get to be in this environment every day, and it's, it's, it's great, um, and I get to do what I want. Like I, yeah, I get to decide. You know what? Today I want to focus on this, and that's what I think is best for the studio, and that's what I'm going to do. So you know, there's there's a certain amount of selling that has to happen. Of like, the studio is awesome, um, but it's also about finding the right fit. And this kind of environment is not for everyone. And you know, there are times where I have to turn people away, even though they're like, "Oh, I really want to work at that game company. I really respect what you do." And you know, they have honestly got like a solid background and like they're skilled but I have to turn them away because I don't think that they would fit I don't think they would actually enjoy working here because working in this kind of environment where you're just doing these prototypes is actually really stressful and as much as it's great to have all this freedom of hey I want to work on this thing I think this is what the game needs if you have that for like two plus years where no one is telling you this is what the game is it's like no you go make the game you go tell me what the game is um, a lot of people can't handle that environment. They need the kind of feedback. They need the structure. And they need someone saying, yeah, I need you to do these five things by the end of the week. Or, you know, maybe they're just not really good at communicating, something like that. So what I do is I say, hey, you're going to be working really hard, but if you're really passionate about it and you really like it, you're going to have a phenomenal time. 
But if you need a lot of structure, you're going to just like spaz out and like you're you're not gonna you're not gonna want to stay here anymore. So there's an element of selling as well as scaring. And then obviously I'm evaluating people. I like I listen to you know what are their values and filter that. Hey, they're great. Okay, let's hopefully move forward to the next step. So I'm gonna talk about tests and. I know that this has been uh, a bit of a point of contention within the industry of like, well, why is this necessary? Why do people, uh, why do candidates get subjected to this process? And, and so like, I can see both sides of it. And so I definitely take this into consideration. I don't think it's cool to ask people to do free work for you, especially for any like extended amount of time. Like that's not what a test is. It's not to like steal people's IP and put it into your game because you're too cheap to pay them. Um, and it's not to put them through an endurance test. You don't give them like a month long assignment. A test is, and I think specifically at that game company, why, why is this step so crucial? Why can we not skip this? Is because what we do is so different and our, the way we work and the skills we need is like it's such a specific combination that just because you said like, hey, but I've been working in the industry, you know, X studio for five years and, you know, I've been in these roles, it's like, yeah, but, you know, did, did you have, like, 15 other people on your specific team just to do, you know, AI? Or were, like, you doing the AI? Um, do you know how to talk to artists? Do you know how to both implement and, like, design and, and brainstorm? And so we do this to go, like, I want to know that if you come to the studio, you actually have these baseline, one, skills, but two, is taste. Because sometimes people are, they're awesome at what they do and they're really good at enabling other people, but so much of what a, that game company experiences is seeped in like this emotion and artistry is like, well, there's only a handful of people to do any one task anyway. It's like, you kind of have to be able to do it and make it look and feel really good. So that's what a test is for. Um, so I'm going to talk about a field engineer test. And I kind of talked a little bit of what a field engineer does. A feel engineer, um, another way to put it is like they're a hybrid kind of designer engineer because we don't have any just sole designers at that game company. If you work at that game company, you have to be able to implement basically any idea you have because, hey, there's only so many people. So if you think about what user experience is, and usually the title is like, oh, we're hiring a user experience designer. It's like, well, at that game company, we flip it. We go, well, you're, we're hiring a user experience engineer. So basically, you have all the sensibilities of what is going to be the optimal user experience. But I also have the engineering heavy background that I can go and implement that. Um, so a fun factoid about that game company, which most people are surprised when they find out about, is that the majority of the TGC team is actually engineers um, because we need the people who can build all the systems. So again, what is a field engineer? They, they're the ones who's putting together, it's like, well, how, they're, they're making the decisions and Im implementing, how is the character gonna move? What are the baseline interactions? What are the systems? Well, how does the AI work? How does the camera work? Um, so you're creating all these like moment to moment decisions that creates the larger feeling of being in this world and uh, it's like, you know, color choices. Uh, what is it, what's in the environment? What does the audio sound like? What is the pacing? And how do the characters interrelate with each other? So I'm gonna show you this. This is a test submitted successfully by someone we went on to hire. And uh, sitting right here. Um, so the background for this, we the prompt was create an experience where it's like you, you're, you're taking the player back to the experience of being a child and like you're kind of tapping into childhood nostalgia and it was very open-ended so we, we part of the test is also to see how are you going to interpret this what are your creative like skill sets like and decision making skills so in this experience we have this one central character who is what we'd call like a childlike figure and they're out kind of in this world and they're with a parent-like figure and then this other fun little figure comes along and so the the player figures kind of has to decide well, do I kind of want to go explore and experiment with this fun new character, or do I want to stick with my parent? And so when I play, I just have pay attention to like the really detailed choices made of like, how does the character move? How smooth is it? How, what, is the feel, yeah, what is the feeling you're getting from this feel engineer test?
So that's actually just a recording of me playing through um, really quickly this uh, the, the initial part of the experience. So yeah, we hired. We thought this was a great test. Um, they made really good choices. Did they successfully convey the feeling of being a child, and it felt good. So higher. Um, next up, we have a concept artist test. So really quickly, this is basically a color script. So within like one single image, can you portray a simple story arc in like, tell us what color choices you would use to convey the mood. And so this is also someone we went on to hire. Um, I really like this other image that they did. So within a single shot, can you produce an image that evokes, evokes an emotion or feeling or suggests a narrative? And I feel like, hey, this is, this is an image that's going to capture you. So... We went on to hire this artist, and we are very happy with his contributions. <clears throat> okay, so that's the testing process. Oh, that took forever, right? Um, actually, we try to, again, to be humane about it. We try and really hone in on, let's say this is a day of work. We don't want you to do too much more than that. Maybe include some brainstorming time or polishing time, but we really want to know what your baseline skills are. Like, you could just pump out in a day. And... The thing is, as much time as it takes for a candidate to do a test, um, we put so much thought into how do we tailor this test to give us exactly the right data that fits the role that we're trying to hire for. And, and tests are interesting because although it's work that we ask a candidate to do, we also it's always about hiring and selling. Um, you want to use a test as a barometer to say these are this is what we care about and these are the kind of things you're actually going to be working on at that game company. Um, so if you enjoyed this test and you thought it like challenged you in all the right ways and you want to do this every day, then you will like working at that game company. So okay, we get to the testing process. Hopefully, it is successful, and we move on to the next stage, and that is the all day group interview with these people and. Uh, so obviously this is a huge time investment from our side as well as the candidates, but the thing is not that many candidates get to this stage because this is basically the final stage where you spend a day with us and you talk to us, you have lunch with us, we show you the game, uh, you sit in on meetings, we, we, you get to meet every single person on the team so that if you finally do join us, it's like you know exactly, well, you have a good idea of exactly what you'll be doing with who and how, and how do we operate, what are our values, how does a typical day at that game company look like, and yeah, it is a lot of investment to think, well, you take like one day out of downtime from development, and that's because we consider hiring so important and such a huge investment that we're really trying to hire for the long term, it's like we're taking you into our team, so we, one, want to make sure that we can work with you and we can communicate well and there's like a good vibe, right, between us. But it's also, hey, you're evaluating us too. So if you're going to be devoting yourself to working at this company for several years, don't you want to know who you're working with? So, yeah, you're going to meet every single person. Um, and that's the point of an all-day interview. And it's also really important. We, we will fly people in to spend the day with us. All right. So... Hiring doesn't always work out, and sometimes you have to reject people. That's a natural par part of the hiring process, but we have to remember that these are people we're, we are dealing with, and especially, like, I'm usually, like, the main contact for dealing with this person, and if they've gone through all these different stages, and if they've invested so much time in, like, doing tasks and doing interviews, it's like they, they deserve a lot of respect, and... And part of it is, yeah, because th that's another person I'm communicating with, and it's not an anonymous person. It's someone I'm very carefully like, trying to filter to bring into the studio. So I must have liked them on some level. Um, but also, well, it's good to be nice, right? Um, but these are people who are going to go on and tell other people about your studio and what their process is like, because people like to talk. And you know what? If... They were like they had some things that were a really good fit, and you thought they were really smart, but for some reason they just didn't fit the role. And if you've, if you know, if I've done my job well and I've left a really strong impression on them, maybe you know they know people in the industry. They might actually recommend people back to apply at that studio. And so if you have this like long-term, big-picture thinking, 
doing, always putting care and thought and attention to this process, even when you have to reject someone, can really work you know, in the studio's favor. And so it's important to be respectful. And so an example of this is, there were a number of times where I was uh, evaluating some junior hires, maybe fresh out of school for a programming position. And so I felt really bad where I was like, oh, I really liked you and I think you had the right motivation and you know, oh, you seem great. You just don't have the baseline experience. And I felt bad of like, oh, I've just got to like reject you and tell you to go work somewhere else. So one thing I did was I pastored the other programmers of like, come on, just give me like a cheat sheet. Like, what do you want to see? Like, just lay it out. Like, this is not something we advertise on our website, but this is something that I put together. And I, I literally, I, I've said this on multiple occasions. I'm like, hey, you know what? If you work here, you need to be able to do these things. But it, even if you don't work here, this is going to help you in the industry when you go work in another studio. So my recommendation to you is like, hey, take some time. Make sure you know all these things. And that will be good. And I think that's just a way of... They've given me their time. I, I, want, I don't want to leave them empty-handed and like, sorry, I can't hire you. So, I mean, just little things you can do. But hopefully, everything works out and you, you know, offers accepted. <clears throat> so, as I said, the hiring never ends because you want to make sure people know that, hey, I really care about you and I want you on our team and I want everything to work out. So, you know, people, it's, it's, a, it's this whole messy process. And um, even if you've done this complete hiring process, once they get into the studio, you have to devote, devote a lot of attention and onboarding them and making sure they do really know how things are done. They, knew, they know who to talk to, to ask questions. They feel like someone is invested in their success. And so you, a lot of times, new hires, like we work really close with them, definitely the first few days, you know, sometimes the first few weeks, sometimes months, just to make sure it's like they're getting on that right path. So it's like, because as I said, what we do is really stressful. So if they're coming in, they feel like, geez, I'm, I'm making all these prototypes and they keep, nothing's sticking, nothing's getting in the game. And they make sure that they feel like failure is a success because it meant you're trying something and you've defined that that thing doesn't work. And it's not that not, none of your stuff is getting in the game because most of, I mean, if it takes us this many years to make a game and it's not a huge game, most of the stuff we're making is not getting into the game. So onboarding is really important. Um, because it feels really good if you're a new hire and on your first day you're already submitting stuff into the game. I mean, that just feels good. Um, I would say like a second part that I personally think is really important is that when we hire someone and they have a partner, that that partner feels like they're excited about their partner's uh, new opportunity and they feel welcomed by the team and they get to know like, hey, here's the people that my partner's going to be working with. So it's like, it's just extending of like, hey, when you make an offer to someone, it's like you're taking the whole package. And it's like, okay, they have, they have people in their lives. Get them invested in being really excited and being supportive of the work that they do because sometimes it is going to be hard and you want them, you want everyone on that same side of like, hey, you're really excited about this job, it's a tough day, it's okay, you can do it, like, come back again. And, you know, if you're going to have, like, social events, make sure those partners are invited. So um, we're getting kind of close to the end. Um, so just wrapping up, like, if I've done my job well, the hiring process builds retention and prevents talent poaching, which I think is really important also, because if I've invested all this time to get awesome people into my studio I want to make sure that they're happy, and if they're happy and someone else comes along and wants to throw all this money at them, they're going to be like, you know what, what I got is really good. So it's a, it's a, it's a whole process, and it, it matters. And the idea is I'm creating dedicated teams that work well together. So really wrapping up, um, what's it like working with a studio of hopeless perfectionists, and why do we do it in a few slides? Working with hopeless perfectionists is super frustrating. Why? Because when you've been working on a thing for a really long time and that, you, know, you haven't talked about the game and it hasn't been published and we extended the deadline again, it's a lot easier to just kind of be tempted to say, you know, it's good enough. Let's, like, let's ship it. Let's keep going. And then just enjoy kicking back with your colleagues rather than like really pushing and fighting for these unproven ideas and impossible ideals. But that would be a lot less meaningful and that's not why we do it because we're hopeless perfectionists. So it's going to be frustrating sometimes, but that's part of the process. I think working at the studio and being a hopeless perfectionist is also very motivating because you're getting these constant new challenges and you're creating these new discoveries that keep us ever pushing towards something greater. And that really actually leaves you hungry to go find the next goal and your next set of accomplishments and see how far you can go. 
working at that game company is inspiring because we make experiences where players feel something they've never felt before. It, sometimes it's because it's the first game they've played and they've actually decided, hey, that looks interesting. Or maybe they've had a lifetime of playing games and they're like, I've never felt that in a game before. And when you see this happening over and over again with all new players, you realize I'm making something that makes a difference to people in this industry. Hiring for hopeless perfectionists, the studio, the work is challenging because we're, re we're redefining new boundaries of a worthwhile interactive experience. And that can be really overwhelming when you don't have these baseline models to work off of. But on the other hand, it also means we get to redefine new boundaries of interactive experience. So, you know, double as short. Working at that game company, it can be funny and empowering when we're comfortable expressing ourselves as individuals together. And yes, that's an actual picture from our studio. Working at that game company is worth it because it's really hard, but in the end we get to make wonderful game experiences that we're proud of, that are different, and that we wish to see more of. And in the end, it's because we're building cohesive teams to break through hard times and make something great. This is that game company. Dude, are you still going to look wistful? Let's all, let's, I don't all know. The, let's all look at the camera and then look wistfully into the distance. <laughs> it's hiring for hopeless perfectionists. <laughs> Thanks. Q&A. Um, so I'm very open and welcome to do q and I think we have like three minutes. So um, if anyone is interested and we don't have time to like fit you in, I will be in the room across the hall. It's room 2002. You're welcome to join me there. And sprinkled throughout this uh, room are my colleagues. So you can go harass them as well and ask them lots of questions. Yeah, they're here and here and here. So... Um, yes. Um, I'm just curious, have you had any experiences where you've made a mistake in hiring or where something just hasn't quite worked out and how you've uh, dealt with it or would recommend dealing with that? Yes. Um, actually, so in the three years that I've... Oh, sorry, I need to repeat the question. You asked me a really uh, lengthy question. I don't know if other people will have time, so please stick around. Um, the question is... Have I ever had an experience where I hired someone and it didn't work out and what ha or what would I recommend? Um, that's really tricky. So it's happened three times in the three years that I've been there, which is like an okay rate. Right? It's not great. Um, what I found out, um, sometimes when that happens, when we hired someone and it didn't work out, it was because we actually subverted the process that I talked about here. So it, there's a reason why we have a process and we go through these steps. It's because we're really trying to do as thorough an assessment before, you know, making that huge commitment, which really is, it feels really bad when you put in all this effort to bring someone to the team and then, oh, it didn't work out. Like, that emotionally feels bad. So I would say follow the process. Don't skip. Don't think like, oh, I know better. Oh, they're work out. They're fine. Oh, they're, they've had enough experience. We don't have to do that step. Or they come highly recommended. It's like, you still have to do the step. And I think the other thing I would advise is if you know someone is not working out, you want to identify that sooner rather than later. And really, you want to leave, have the person leave on amicable terms. So when it doesn't work out, it's not always like, oh, we're rejecting that person. Sometimes that person's like, you know, I'm not really getting what I'm looking for from the studio. So you, what I advise is if someone feels like they're ready to leave or if we feel like maybe it's better for everyone if this person leaves, is you make it safe for them to leave. So you don't, you're not there to like villainize them. You want to go like, hey, if you feel like you can do your best work somewhere else, we're going to support you. Like, do you need, you know, references? Do you need recommendations? Do you need us to talk to people? will help you because we, we still like you. We want you to do well. And you don't want to have, like, bad feelings. So, Or also, sometimes it's, like, making sure that you give them some kind of compensation of, like, okay, if you're going to be out of work for a while, you're like, here's some severance. It just it makes it safe so it's, like, they're not going to feel like, oh, I'm alone on this boat when they leave. Um, uh, hi. Um, I was wondering roughly what your um, success rate is based on number of applicants who apply for a position and then the number that you would actually give an offer to, roughly? 
Okay, so um, to break it down into numbers, so like I said, when I started, there were three people, so I would be fourth. Um, we're at 15 people right now, so I'm only going to be speaking to the duration of time when I was there in these three years. So what that's like seven people, and then we grew to 15. Obviously, some people left, so there was a few more hires. Um, so we made eight hires uh, that weren't previous developers on previous games or uh, the people who were there or myself. Um, so eight hires. I've seen thousands of applications. Um, so I guess that's also why I kind of ha highlight those things of like, work on an awesome portfolio, make yourself stand out, make it, don't have a three page long resume that says everything that I can't read. Um, come talk to us at talks and stuff like just, I mean, we're people, if you seem cool, we will talk to you. We don't get to respond to everyone, but uh, as I said, there are people we hire who just straight up apply. Thank you. Oh, I didn't say the question. Um, what is our rate of hiring based on the number of applicants? Hi. Uh, this is very inspiring. Thank you. Um, Susan Mocklin, Punch B Music. Um, can you speak about contracting versus hiring um, and how you might adapt these tips to finding a contractor with the eventual goal of, of you know, ideally hiring for a permanent team? Okay, so the question is, how do we deal with hires, um, full-time hires versus contractors, and kind of how do we deal with that and what the difference is? And I would say, at that game company, we strongly prefer hiring full-time hires because the idea is, we've already gone through this extensive review process. It's like, we either want you or we don't. And this idea of like kind of either a part-time or extended trial hasn't really worked out in our favor very well. And the thing is, like, if we're not sure we want you, Again, like we're very um, feely people. So like once you're in that studio with us, we are like going to latch onto you. And so it's kind of like once you're in, you're in. And then like if you're in, but then you're not quite the fit we want, like then that's just kind of bad. Because then it's like, oh, we have to fire that person. But we really like them and they're cool. Um, so we really try and just uh, focus on full time. So they, they can get, they're a full time hire. They get our full attention and all that comes with being part of that. Um, we do have some contractors, but those are for non-development roles and things that can be a little bit more tangential, such as our, our current community manager is part-time. Although I am hiring a lead community manager to be full-time in our studio, because I think community management is really important. So I'm just going to say that out right now. Um, and our publicist, uh, she works with us part-time. Um, She's, I think, also a special exception because she really gets us. And I think that's another thing with contractors. Like, if their mind is elsewhere or spread out, they are not going to necessarily be the best fit in making good choices. So you really need people, like, in the team sweating it out with you day in, day out, and know, like, what's best. Because, again, it's really hard to define the needs. It's like, but if you're there every day, you see what's going on, you can better make choices that help the students. So I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, it looks like we're out of time. I'll be in 2002 across the hall if you want to um, follow up with any of us here. There's a bunch of us. Please fill out your session evaluations, and thank you. Enjoy the rest of GC.